so much for the kind introduction. Um, I will show you some some of the work in sheep as well today. And so I'll be talking about T and B cell recirculation through inflamed skin. And um, let's start. So we're interested in lymphocyte recirculation. As you all know, lymphocytes recirculate continuously throughout the body. They travel in the bloodstream, shown here, and they um, leave the blood to enter like organized lymphoid tissues, like the lymph node shown here. They um, enter the lymph node by migrating through these specialized postcapillary venules, and they are termed endothelial venules for lymph nodes and pyrus patches. And lymphocytes will look for antigen in the lymph node, and if they don't find antigen, uh, they are subsequently leave through the efferent lymph that is shown here, and then by the thoracic duct they re-enter the bloodstream. And um, in addition to this migratory pathway through organized lymphoid tissues, in particular effector and memory lymphocytes also efficiently extravasate into extra lymphoid tissues, shown here like the skin as an example. So again they'll um, go through these postcapillary venules, look for antigen, and if they don't find antigen, most of the time they will uh, leave the tissue through the afferent lymph, which then gets them to the uh, closest or draining lymph node. And they have a second chance to find antigen. And if they don't, they will also leave the lymph node through the efferent lymph and re-enter the bloodstream by the thoracic duct. Because lymphocytes keep doing this over and over and over again, this is termed recirculation as opposed to just circulation. So they'll be going from the blood into the tissue, into lymph, and back into the blood. And this process is very important uh, for immunosurveillance. So, um, <coughs> in, so it enables the immune system to detect and eliminate pathogens, but also cancerous cells throughout the body. But there's a cost of this process. So at the same time, um, this uh, lymphocyte trafficking into these tissues promotes inflammation and, and allergy and autoimmunity. So it depends on your point of view if you want lymphocytes to uh, recirculate through these tissues or not. And um, so my lab has become very interested recently in, in the skin, which is a key barrier organ. So what does that mean when people refer to that as a barrier organ? It basically means that the skin is exposed to a lot of different threats uh, on a daily basis. So you'll see here that on, on one hand there are a lot of things that are affecting different tissues as well, like infections or all different types of uh, pathogens can uh, target the skin. But at the same time there are some threats that are very, very skin specific, like uh, insect bites, so you don't have as many mosquito bites of, let's say, your liver or your intestine compared to the skin. Then there are also things like thermal insults or chemical insults, so imagine a coffee spill on your skin, your liver doesn't have to deal with that, so a lot of other organs are a lot more protected from these threats, and then also, let's say, UV radiation, so a lot of insults. And on top of these, um, the skin is also the frequent target of immune insults in uh, cases of allergies and autoimmunity. And uh, it's really the cells of the skin immune system that are in charge of repair when there's damages occurring um, to the skin, but also defense against pathogens. So as soon as there's a barrier breach, um, <coughs> because the skin is colonized, so they can any time um, it can in infection occur, so that is important, but a very large part of the skin immune system is in charge of suppression of overt inflammation. As you can imagine, if you had a very strong response to every mosquito bite or a scratch, um, that'd be very bad. So what I found very impressive as an example, when you do a tape strip of the skin, so human skin, just basically like a band-aid you take off, um, this uh, that friction, uh, within hours, the epidermis of the skin will start to make <coughs> anti-inflammatory cytokines like IL-10. So I thought it was very impressive just from a little tape strip showing how the skin is busy suppressing uh, overt inflammation. So then <coughs> um, when we are looking at inflamed skin, so this is here the epidermis of the skin and the chronic skin inflammation, uh, this is a skin granuloma. Uh, we know that 
the cells um, that enter from the bloodstream, so here is a blood vessel, I don't know if you can see it well from the... Um, so this is a blood vessel, it's filled with red blood cells and there are some lymphocytes and they are ready to enter the site of inflammation and it's known that these cells will feed the inflammatory reaction and that homing of these cells into the site is very important for maintaining the inflammatory response. But if you're lucky and you keep looking through the site, you might also find these lymph vessels so shown here, so there are no red blood cells in there, and this is filled up with lymphocytes. Yes, and here's a dendritic cell, and these cells are on their way out of the site of inflammation. So if you think about it, it should be a balance of cells um, entering and leaving that determine what is in, uh, in the tissue. And of course, it's never this simple, so you have pro- and anti-inflammatory lymphocytes that enter the site, and they will influence what's going on here, and also um, it is pro- and anti-inflammatory lymphocytes that leave the site, and then the uh, result of these two should then determine what's in the tissue. So we think really these two arms do uh, influence the quality and the magnitude of inflammation, the clinical symptoms, and both arms could be uh, the target of anti-inflammatory therapy, and so currently there are some uh, therapies on the market that target mostly this um, pathway, and um, in particular, the, or actually only the pro-inflammatory component of that. And so, um, just to remind you, you probably all know that, or heard about it at some point, so migration from the blood into tissues is fairly well characterized and it's mediated by uh, three main steps. And um, those are rolling, activation, and adhesion. So I'll just guide you through that because I'll come back to that um, later in the second half of my talk. So this is supposed to be the endothelium. And this side is the blood and here's the tissue. And um, this is a leukocyte. So in the first step, the leukocyte uh, gets in contact with the endothelial cells, and this is a low affinity interaction. Um, so that's shown here. So these are molecules on the tips of the microvilli of the cells, and this the blood flow would go um, to this direction, and it leads to the um, connection forming and breaking. And as a result, the leukocyte can um, roll on the endothelium as the um, during this breaking and forming of of connection. And then this now enables more um, contact between the two cell, two cell types and um, the leukocyte can then get activated through G-protein coupled receptors and this activation of the leukocyte will then um, trigger a conformational change of integrins on the cell surface of the leukocyte. So this is supposed to be an integrin and when it's activated, it will open up and high affinity binding sites become open that then can um, bind to the binding partners on the endothelium and this leads to a firm arrest of the cell which um, then enables the subsequent transmigration through the endothelial layer and into the tissue. So um, it, here are some examples of typical rolling molecules, those are selectins and their ligands, but also alpha-4 integrins, for, for example. Um, activation is most of the time carried out by chemokines or some other chemotractants can be that. And here are some typical um, integrins that mediate adhesion. So when we started um, being interested in this exit step from the tissue, it was actually not much known about this, so the assumption was that uh, lymphocytes that leave the tissue do this in a random fashion, that it's, the, uh, that it's a passive process that is primarily determined by fluid flow. And it was found um, in review articles stated that it would be like a vacuum cleaner so that the negative pressure would just suck out the cells from the tissue into lymph. But then, of course, how can you have such a finely modulated process to direct cells into the tissue and then leave it up to randomness, which cells can leave, didn't make sense. And of course, that's not how it was. So um, the uh, CCL7 ligand and CCL21, which is a chemokine, is constitutively expressed by lymphatic endothelial cells. And then we and others could show that T cells require the cognate receptor CCL7 to leave the tissue and then migrate via the 
afrin lymphatics to the draining lymph node, so leave the tissue. So this, um, so this work was done mostly in the absence of inflammation at steady state, and we then asked, so what happens during inflammation? And it's actually then not much known about this. What was known from studies in sheep in the 70s and early 80s um, by B. Morris and Jack Hay and a few others was that there are more lymphocytes that drain a site of inflammation compared to the uninflamed tissue. But at these older studies, there was no analysis of different lymphocyte subsets or even, let's say, T cells. Then, of course, the receptor requirements were not known. And um, the, what we were interested in is really looking at how relevant is exit for the, the course of inflammation. And so we aim to revisit this question. And so we also actually then use the sheep model or mouse model and to induce inflammation, um, we use a very simple model, which is we inject CFA, which is mineral oil with inactivated microbacteria, and we inject that subcutaneously into the skin of these animals. And within actually minutes to hours, this induces a, a acute inflammation that's characterized by a lot of neutrophils in the tissue. And then this inflammation is, uh, it turns, uh, becomes chronic, and it's never resolving, and then actual granuloma forms. And so it's a nice model to study all phases of inflammation. And uh, because I'm going to show you data in these um, different animals, you should find an indication on the slide somewhere what uh, animal it is. And I also have some um, human data later on to show you. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so you should always kind of find what it is. So here's such a granuloma again. Um, so you see in the epidermis, and this is all inflammation. If you um, look at the higher magnification, you'll see that this is um, mononuclear cells, so mostly macrophages and <coughs> lymphocytes that you see in the tissue. And so now, why sheep? You might wonder, <laughs> yes, you can do this in, in all sorts of animals. And so, um, because in the sheep you can actually cannulate the lymphatics that drain the site and look at the cells, because the sheep is um, big enough to do that and cooperative enough. So, because this is something you don't hear about all the time, and I'll just show you quickly how we cannulate these lymphatics. So, this is a complete anesthesia in a sheep. and um, when we do an incision, this is um, the lag, so we do an incision of the skin, and then if you inject the dye subcutaneously, it is being picked up within seconds to minutes, depending on um, where it is, and this lights up the lymphatics, these are collecting vessels, so this lymph is being carried to the draining popliteal lymph node in this case, and so then this helps us find the lymph vessels, but it makes it actually more difficult to cannulate. So usually we don't use the dye for these pictures. So then um, we tie off the vessel. I don't know if you can see that. And then it starts swelling. These are very finely walled vessels, and they're a lot more fragile compared to blood vessels. And then you put a second tie already here, and then you do a very small incision on the vessel and then insert a catheter, and you can tie it in with this to keep it in place, and then tie it here, and then you close up the skin and have the animal recover. And so here's a, again, uh, basically where we have the catheter inserted, so now the cells coming from the skin, instead of going to the draining lymph node, they'll end up in our collection bottle. And this is how it looks on the sheep. Um, so in this case, this is, um, skin draining the side of the animal and the leg. Um, and so you see the animals recover and then you can change the lymph and it's continuously flowing. And so you can do things like induce inflammation, look at changes in real time and things like that. And so just to show you this, these are the cells from the lymph. It's mostly lymphocytes and then a few uh, macrophage or dendritic like cells and um, large and small lymphocytes. Occasionally there's a neutrophil as shown here. And then among the lymphocytes, most of these are actually T cells. And so when we <coughs> now we're looking at which cells are leaving during inflammation, so we looked at 
the cell output of different lymphocyte subsets per hour. And you can see here, these are total cells. And in um, acute inflammation, there was an increase in cells leaving the site of inflammation compared to uninflamed skin. But these were not really lymphocytes. Those were mostly neutrophils, actually. And, but in chronic inflammation was this massive increase in lymphocytes leaving the site, and a lot of these were um, T cells. So in chronic inflammation, there's a massive, the increased uh, exit of cells from the site. And then we looked at these cells, I want to say that by surface markers, none of these cells is of naive phenotype, of the T cells at least. And when we um, look at the cytokine profile, so this is taking the cells, and then stimulating them short-term polyclonally, um, you'll see that there are a lot of L17 and interferon gamma producing CD4 and CD8 T cells in there. You might say, well, these are percentages, but maybe not the most compared to other scenarios. But if you now convert the, the percentages back into numbers, so we've done it here for one animal, then this equaled more than 13 million interferon gamma producing lymphocytes and more than 2 million R17 secreting lymphocytes per hour leaving the site. And then this lesion is only about this size on a 50 kilogram animal. So it's a very large flux of potentially protective or um, dangerous cells depending on your point of view. And so in our idea is what if you now if there's something altered in their exit, you would have probably accumulation of these cells in the tissue, which could be dangerous. So, um, so made us think a bit, a bit more. So then one question we had was, how important could CCO7 still be as an exit receptor from the site of inflammation? And what we did in the sheep is we looked at the responsiveness of these effector lymphocytes uh, to CCO7 ligand. As you can see here, this is um, the T cells coming um, from, these are all C4 T cells, from the uninflamed skin on one side of the animal and then drip coming from the inflamed side um, of the animal. And we see that there's not really much of a difference in their CCL21 responsiveness, so they still express CCL7. So we then wanted to know, so they have a CCL7, but do they require it? We know the ligand is always there, but maybe they don't require it. But in order to test the receptor, it's a lot more difficult in sheep, and the mouse is more convenient. So now we use the mouse model to test the role of CCO7 in exit. And so we induce inflammation <coughs> in the foot pad of the skin by injecting CFA. And then we can label test lymphocyte populations with fluorescent dyes, and then inject them into the site of inflammation and monitor um, the cells when they get to the draining lymph node as shown here. And we have to be fairly quick because, as I showed you in the first, very first slide, lymphocytes will also, they go into the lymph node, but they also leave the lymph node again and then redistribute throughout the blood, to body, making it more difficult to analyze. And we found that um, 12 to 20 hours after transfer was fairly um, safe. So here now is the experiment where we did to, to address the role of CCO7. We uh, made TH1 cells in vitro from wild type or CCO7 deficient animals and then injected this mixture into the acutely inflamed skin or into chronically inflamed skin or and as a control into uninflamed skin and then looked at the different capacities of the cells to migrate out of the site of inflammation into the draining lymph node. And so here, in the absence of inflammation, when these Th1 cells lack CCO7, they are drastically reduced in their capacity to leave this, the site and um, make, enter the lymph node. In acute lymph inflammation, it was also the case. But then in chronic inflammation, they were still impacted by a lack of CCO7, but they still, um, a lot of these Th1 cells made it to the, to the draining lymph node, suggesting that there are alternative receptors in play. And we then spend a lot of time chasing down potential alternative receptors. And it seems to be, I can tell you that, that there's quite some redundancy. We know it is uh, it is G protein coupled receptor mediated because we can block migration by treating with pertussis toxin. But I don't want to even go into alternative receptors today. And instead, I wanted to ask more the question 
but does it matter? So does the exit step matter for the inflammatory response? And so far, what I've shown you, this was uh, generic inflammation. There's not an antigen specificity involved. But if you have T-cell-mediated autoimmunity or T-cell-mediated allergy, what happens is that you have your effector T-cell, like a Th1 cell, being activated with cognate antigen by an antigen-presenting cell at the site in the tissue at the site of inflammation. And then this leads to cytokine secretion and downstream um, uh, symptoms of inflammation, like, um, like swelling and hyperemia as an example. So of course that's a little simplified, but so what we now wanted to know what happens in such a scenario, and we were looking at a, at a model where we could test where we could test what happens when the T cells see antigen and when we could manipulate exit of T cells to then survey what, what happens to the inflammatory response to the T cell mediated inflammation. And so we came across one very elegant, very simple, elegant model by Wayne Stryline. And he termed it local adoptive transfer assay of delayed hypersensitivity. In this model, you have TCR transgenic. Um, Th1 cells that that are injected into the skin together with antigen presenting cells and antigen, and then these basically mimicking what's happening here, and then the interferon gamma that's produced by these Th1 cells then induces localized uh, tissue inflammation that you can assay by measuring the swelling. And um, so Wayne Stryline used this model to manipulate the APCs. So he had different methods to manipulate the APCs and then looking at the induced T-cell mediated inflammation. And we now use the model to manipulate the T-cells and to assay inflammation. I'll show you this in a second. I see some critical <laughs> So basically we inject the cells into the foot pad or into the ear and then um, measure inflammation. So this is the model how it looks without doing much. You have APCs with your OT2 uh, TH1 cells, so th these are specific for ovalbumin. You, these ABCs are pulsed with ovalbumin, you inject them, and you see that uh, then you get tissue swelling that is dependent on the numbers of T cells that you inject. Here, if you just inject the ABCs, you have a very mild, short lived inflammation, but then adding T cells, you get more of an inflammatory response, which you probably expect and then it maxes out, but in this case we kept the numbers of T cells, um, no, we kept the numbers of APCs constant, because they alone have an effect. So now we have this model set up. The first question was what happens now when the T cells see antigen? So to address that, we now have Th1 cells that are either um, TCR transgenic, specific for ovalian, or polyclonal Th1 cells that are for the most don't recognize ovalbumin. And APCs that are either pulsed with ovalbumin or control antigen. And we look at, um, so we inject this mixture into the foot pad and look at migration to the draining lymph node. And so when there's a control antigen, you see there's uh, not much difference, there's no difference in migration between those polyclonal and OT2 TH1 cells. So leaving the, the site of inflammation and migrating to the or the injection site, I should say, and migrating to the lymph node. But in the presence of, of antigen, the uh, migration of the OT2 TH1 cells um, drops, as you can see here, and only the polyclonal T cells migrate. So the antigen reduces migration of antigen-specific T cells. And so this is one experiment, and here's a summary of multiple experiments. You see it's quite a um, drastic effect of T, T cells recognize antigen, they stop leaving at least over the time frame that we looked at. And so now we wondered, can we manipulate this? And we know that CCO7 is an exit receptor. And so what we did was we <coughs> now overexpress CCO7 by using CCO7 transgenic mice cross to OT2 mice. So now we have uh, TH1 cells that are, t that are ovalbumin specific and overexpress CCO7, and then we have just normal um, over specific TH1 cells with just endogenous CCR7. And we, mi we assess migration to the draining node. And so, first of all, this is the CCR7 expression. These transgenic T cells, they just have um, more, they're more homogeneously high in CCR7 expression, but it's not really that much more 
terms of total like max levels, whereas the wild type cells, there are some that are lower expressing. So now, does this influence the, the migratory response? And it does, so in this scenario, over a 20 hour time period, these caesars and transgenic uh, T cells migrate out about twofold better compared to um, the wild type cells, but this is a snapshot and of the response. So, and now the question is, does this, how does it impact the inflammatory response? And we were very happy to see that we get actually the same magnitude of inflammation, but we have a uh, accelerated resolution of inflammation when these effector T cells overexpress the exit receptor. So now, what about a lack of CCR7? Um, we assume that CCR7 is somewhat important because it's a more um, acute response. So here to address that, we now have TH1 cells again that are um, uh, ovalumin specific and then we have CCR7 deficient um, ovalumin specific TH1 cells and then we inject these actually into two separate groups of mice. And this is now uh, even after three days, we have um, the, it's not so surprising um, that the CCR7 deficient antigen specific cells are even more reduced um, in the draining lymph node compared to wild type. And when we look at the inflammatory response, we actually get enhanced and prolonged inflammation when the effector T cells uh, lack CCR7. So from, from that, we now um, basically conclude that we want to just summarize this. So we have T cells that are in there being activated in, at the site of inflammation, then their exit um, is decreased and they can, ensuring that cytokine production at the site of inflammation, which you might not want in um, autoimmunity, for instance, or allergy. But if you can enhance the egress of these cells, that leads to reduced inflammation. And when you have reduced egress, you can enhance inflammation. So now um, there are some implications for that. So anything that will enhance egress from the site is, is now expected to um, ameliorate inflammation. So maybe CCR7 is not a very good drug target, but other molecules perhaps that mediate retention in the tissue could be a target to, um, in, in, to um, treat inflammation. Then of course the question comes up, if, we, if there is impaired egress of effector T cells, maybe in some individuals that would, that would promote uh, enhanced inflammatory responses. So that would be something interesting to look at. Um, and also, of course, what probably this pathway is designed for host defense, making sure that while there is still antigen, meaning there's still uh, an infection, that the T cells stay there and do their job and don't um, disseminate uh, without clearing the infection. So there's a lot uh, to follow up on this. But now I want to completely switch gears, or not completely, but I want to talk to you uh, about B cells and how we got into that. So again, we were looking at T cells, um, mostly T cells and lymphocytes exiting the site of inflammation. So again, this is in the sheep, looking at um, uninflamed and chronically inflamed skin. Here are all our T cell populations leaving the site and they are enhanced in chronic inflammation. Here we also looked at gamma delta T cells. But what we noted was that there were also a lot of B cells and their numbers were increased. And actually um, also in the skin tissue itself, so compared to uninflamed skin, we had this drastic increase in, um, in the tissue. And so we wondered, okay, what are they doing there? And um, it's hard to ignore when it's that many. So um, we actually had in, in some animals up to 50% of the lymphocytes being B cells, so really nothing you can ignore. And um, so then my student was, um, it was her job to find out what's known about B cells in the skin, and she said, well, you know what, they're not even supposed to be there. So she found this uh, um, dermatopathology pathology um, textbook where it was said that they are not, B cells are not part of the normal skin immune system and that they are only recruited in inflammation and immune mediated diseases. So, okay, but we just saw them even in the absence of inflammation. And um, 
So then he said, okay, let's look a little bit more through the literature. And actually there's quite some evidence that B cells are important uh, in regulating immune uh, responses in the skin. So, as, so here's some of my favorite examples. So in B cell deficient mice, they are a lot more susceptible to cutaneous infection with herpes simplex virus. And this is not just due to antibody, because when you reconstitute the mice with immune serum, that phenotype is helped a little bit, but they are still a lot more susceptible. And the of this paper, actually, they suggest that there might be a local role for um, B cells in the skin. And they didn't look at that. And then there's now studies in, in humans that are that suggest a more anti-inflammatory role, a protective role of B cells. So when you deplete B cells with rituximab uh, for other reasons in um, humans, there is quite a number of individuals that develop the inflammatory skin disease, psoriasis. So I thought, okay. And then this is now supported by studies in uh, in mice where it was shown that um, B cells are protective, or especially L10 producing B cells are protective in suppressing um, uh, skin inflammation in a psoriasis model, but also in a, uh, like a cutaneous hypersensitivity model. So um, we said, okay, so let's look at this a little bit more. But I should also point out that in these mouse studies right now, everybody assumes that B cells are um, doing this by suppressing T cell responses in lymphoid tissues and not in the skin. And so, so it's still about B cells are not in the skin. So of course the first question then was, are they in the skin? And so we looked, looked at this. Um, so here's the inflamed skin, this is the epidermis in the mouse. And um, here are blood vessels in green. And you see here, you have a lot of B cells in the tissue. Um, so in inflammation, they are not uh, so difficult to find. They are really in the tissue, not intravascular, as you can see here. And then in the um, absence of inflammation, it's a lot more difficult to find lymphocytes or even T cells that are not gamma down T cells in, in mouse skin. So in, here's the epidermis, hard to see. Um, here's a B cell. They're always in the dermis. We've never seen them in the epidermis. Here's another one next to a hair follicle in the skin. So they are definitely in the skin, and now, uh, not using histology, but rather flow cytometry, we went ahead to look at um, uh, what kind of B cells. So first of all, using flow cytometry here now on normal skin, we have a nice population of B cells, and um, also in inflammation, using again these skin granulomas. And in human skin, because then you could say, well, what about human skin? And uh, we do find a small population, but very consistent among um, different uh, donors. So there are definitely B cells also in human skin. And, uh, but it's a small population. And so one um, big question now was, what is the function of these B cells? And one, one idea to figure out what their function is and their role in this uh, um, as part of the skin immune system is by looking at what um, B cell subset they belong to. And just to remind you that there are different subsets of B cells, and um, mainly B1 and B2 B cells. And B2 B, B cells, they are composed of follicular and marginal zone B cells. I don't want to bore you with that. So most of the time when people talk about B cells, they are referring to these follicular or um, conventional B cells that are mounting your typical T cell dependent immune responses and they are 99% of all vaccines are targeting responses by follicular B cells. And, but then there are also so-called innate like B cells with more conserved B cell receptors that are um, that recognize pathogens but also autoantigens. A lot of times these are usually IgM high. Um, cells and then marginal zone B cells are in the, in the uh, spleen. So when we look at the function, um, it was very obvious that T cell independent antibody responses are mounted very well by E1 cells or by these innate like B cells. And we thought they would be very interesting for um, the skin as a barrier organ. So if you require a T cell to respond, then the skin or that might not be the best place, and it would be make more sense to be in a in a um, lymphoid tissue. And also, these B1 cells, they have other innate-like um, properties, so they can 
Actually, they can be directly antimicrobial. They've been shown to be able to phagocytose, to kill bacteria. They can make other sets of cytokines, like GM-CSF. Um, they've been shown already to be in other external fluid sites, like body cavities, but also the small intestinal lamina propria. So we thought that would be um, interesting. And so when we looked at the subsets of B cells in, this, in the uh, mouse skin, so here the peritoneum as a mar um, by comparison, which is known to harbor a lot of these B1 cells. So here is a so they are CD19 positive and then CD43 positive, B220 low or negative. So you see there is a large population in peritoneal cavity, but a, a lot of the cells in the uninflamed and inflamed skin are also of B1 phenotype. And I sh I want to uh, emphasize that the blood. In normal mouse blood, it's about 1% of the B cells. So this is quite an enrichment compared to blood. And then when you look at other markers for B1 cells, so these were CD5, also CD5 positive B1A cells and CD5 negative B1B cells. And a lot of them express CD11B, which is um, fairly characteristic for B1 cells. So they have a little bit of a myeloid touch, if you want. So. Uh, then in humans, it was a lot more difficult because the markers are not as well characterized and it's a lot more controversial whether there are B1 cells or whether you can call these cells B1 cells. But we definitely found a population that is consistent with that of um, B1-like cells in uh, humans. But it's, um, and they are somewhat enriched in the skin compared to blood, but it's not as drastic as in the mouse. So, but we do see them. So then something we noticed when we were trying to look at effector functions of these cells was that a lot of these B cells in the skin um, made IL-10. So you see a CD20 for a B cell marker and IL-10. So they are, but they are also non-B cells making IL-10. And uh, using flow cytometry, it's a lot easier to quantitate the IL-10 production. And so, oops. Um, this is now after short-term stimulation using R10 GFP reporter mice. You see that the majority of the B1 cells in, in the um, uninflamed but also inflamed skin makes R10, but not so much the B2 cells. They're actually very low. And this was true for this granuloma model, but also a psoriasis model. And so what about um, human skin? Here, um, again, human being more difficult, but definitely we found that a lot of the B cells in the skin upon stimulation made IL-10. And I don't want to say much about how it's correlated with CD43 expression because I think we haven't looked at enough donors yet. There was definitely an enrichment in IL-10 secreting B cells in the skin compared to the blood. So IL-10 secreting B cells in human skin is something that's been kind of overlooked so far as a potential anti-inflammatory population. And so now we were interested in, so it's known that these IL-10 secreting peritoneal B1 cells can suppress inflammation. So what is now the relationship of these skin B1 cells and peritoneal B1 cells? And are these even B1 cells or do they just look like that by uh, phenotype? And so, um, so, so we basically asked, um, do they maybe, can they migrate? So it's known that peritoneal B1 cells are not a sessile population, they actually recirculate. So Jason Sister and also Martin Lipp's group showed that. They, um, at, that they continuously leave the peritoneum, enter the blood, and re enter the peritoneum. And then um, a few studies showed if there's an inflammatory stimulus in the body, that this will release large numbers of B1 cells and they can be recruited to respiratory tract. Um, then reactive lymph nodes and spleen, as well as the small intestinal lamina propria. And so we then ask, well, do they also traffic to the skin? So, and to address that, we induced inflammation in mice, shown here with CFA, and then we did a simple experiment where we transferred peritoneal B cells that were labeled um, IP, and then we give LPS, which was shown to induce that relocation um, to some of these systems, like spleen and lamina propria. And then we analyze 20 hours after that if we can see any of our transferred B cells in the skin. And so here's 
at the result. So this is still the site of injection. So as described, we find that a population of the B1 cells in the small intestinal lamina propria are donor derived, but in a similar proportion as um, of the skin B1 cells is also donor derived as well as the blood. So this establishes that they these B1 cells leave the peritoneum, enter the blood, and can migrate to the skin. But so that establishes the pathway, but it still doesn't tell us about the efficiency of migration. And to do that, uh, to address that, we did a competitive homing assay, and we call a short-term homing, where we induce inflammation with CFA, and then inject a mixture of splenic B2 and peritoneal B1 cells IV, and then look at the migration to different sites after 12 to 15 hours. And it was, um, so that's shown here. So homing, this is basically comparing the input to the migrated cells, and then homing index of one would mean that there is no difference in migration between these two subsets. And it was quite obvious that the B1 cells were uh, a little worse in getting into uh, lymph nodes, but they had a lot high propensity, more than 30-fold high propensity to migrate into a peritone cavity and the inflamed skin. And that's actually a really big difference for homing. And this included also cells um, that can make R10, as shown here. So the injected cells, about half of them can make R10, and the ones that migrated into the inflamed skin um, can make R10. So, so then as a um, trafficking interested group, we were wondering what mediates migration of B1 cells into skin. And so coming back to our multi-step adhesion cascade, um, to make a long story short, so these are the, the molecules that are known to have some skin specific specificity in um, directing T cells into the skin. But unfortunately, we didn't find any evidence that these molecules were involved in B1 cell trafficking into skin. But instead, what we found was that they had a lot higher levels of alpha-4, beta-1 integrin. So on the peritoneal B1 cells compared to splenic B2, but also skin B1 compared to skin B2. And um, not only that, we also saw using an antibody that recognizes an, an activated state of beta-1 integrin, we noticed that there was already activated beta-1 on these um, peritoneal B1 cells, even at steady state. And, and um, after they are released from the peritoneum base in, into blood, basically on their way into tissues, there's um, this drastic enrichment in these activated um, integrin-expressing B1 cells. Or they have an upright I should say. And this is a feature that's described for in K cells and some effector T cells, <coughs> but not really for um, B cells. So we then asked us alpha 4 beta 1 mediate migration into the skin. And uh, to address that, we blocked alpha 4 integrin with an antibody. And what we saw was that that this antibody treatment completely abrogated migration of B1 cells into peritone cavity and the inflamed skin, but it did not influence migration of the B2 cells into skin. So it does mediate that migration. So now I just want to put this together, so this is really work in progress, um, and I'll show you how I see that in context and where we are going with this next. So we have uh, steady state recirculation of B1 cells between peritoneum and tissues. Actually, we also showed with ALF together that the B1 cells migrate into the uninflamed skin as well. We don't know yet if that requires ALF 4 beta 1. It probably does because um, there's VK, the ligand VCAM1 is constitutively expressed in skin. And we know that pre entry into the peritoneum. Uh, requires alpha 4 beta 1. So when there's now um, an insult to the skin, uh, like a you know, sword injury or something, you <laughs> it's not quite clear how this will communicate to the peritoneum. Uh, but for sure, this will upregulate lo local VCAM1 on the vasculature. And uh, so it's uh, 
it could be that this injury now, you have the microbes on the skin, that that LPS that enters gets into the system or communicates to the peritoneal cavity. Is it shown that TLR4 can mediate that, um, or that release? That at least LPS dependent release of B1 cells, or it could be endogenous TLR4 ligands like hyaluronic acid, isoforms that are formed in inflammation that um, that signal to the peritoneum that there's an injury or inflammation, um, but we don't know that yet. So what <coughs> we think then uh, those B1 cells are being released from the peritoneum, they enter the blood, and by expressing this activated alpha-4 beta-1, they will find these VCAM1 expressing effector sites, and this might somewhat offset the chemokine receptor requirements um, of the B1 cells to get into tissues like that, because they don't, um, we didn't find them expressed, or chemokine receptors for skin, I should say. Um, and so this will allow them to enter the site where they make L10. We also know that they make some IgM, which will then um, limit uh, overt inflammation locally. So that's our idea. And um, so now the big question is, what is the role of this pathway in, uh, in inflammatory skin diseases, and particularly in psoriasis? So we're interested in psoriasis because of these known um, um, connection that if you that in some individuals at least when you deplete B cells that you get the disease um, induced. Also, psoriasis is associated with very low levels of IL-10 locally, so there's a lot of IL-10 dependence in that um, in, in that disease. But also, uh, what could be the role of these cells where you might not want suppression of inflammation or of localized responses like chronic infection or um, skin cancers. So that's a lot to explore. And we right now focus on uh, the skin inflammation. So, and finally I want to thank people who are involved. So this is my lab now. Um, and Rhonda now has picked up some of the human B cells in the skin and um, we're trying to set, to set up all the models right now for addressing the role of B cells and skin inflammation. And then most of the work I've shown in the B cells was work by Sky, um, and then the T cell work a lot was by Daniela, and these two were also involved. And then we had collaborators at Penn um, who were helping us so in the, in the, um, the CHS model where we have the, or the the Stryline model, so we actually had people from another lab measuring the inflammatory responses because you can be very biased when you measure the swelling. And so these, um, Eric Tarkovsky and Tiffany Weinkopf helped us with that. Um, Gordon helped us with the, a lot of the microscopy. And I had Mike Kanger with B-cell questions and then Amy Payne and Sveti Dencher who are great for the skin B-cells. They are in the Department of Dermatology at Penn. And Al helped us with the beta-1 integrin work, and Nigel Caroline gave us some um, antibodies. And I'll thank you for your attention. I hope you have some questions and ideas.